Dr. Anthony Fauci, the former head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, testified before the House Oversight and Accountability Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic yesterday. Now, throughout his time before the subcommittee, he both downplayed his influence on government pandemic guidance and denied that he sought to cover up investigations into a lab leak causing as the origins, being the origins of the pandemic. Now, despite the fireworks throughout the hearing, did Dr. Fauci deflect accountability or did we come any closer to getting answers? Well, with me now to talk about this is Dr. Robert Malone, Chief Medical and Regulatory Officer for the Unity Project and internationally recognized physician scientist who specializes in advanced development of medical countermeasures to infectious diseases. Dr. Malone, welcome back to Washington Watch. Good to have you. Thank you for having me on, Tony. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing quite well. Thank you. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on Dr. Fauci's testimony yesterday, in particular that he acknowledged that some of the dictates that they put out lacked scientific evidence. Yes. Yeah, so uh, in particular, the six foot distancing, but uh, throughout all of this, what was clear in Dr. Fauci's testimony was number one, that he had been very well coached. Uh, this was extremely smooth presentation. Uh, we saw an aw shucks uh, down home Tony that I uh, have never seen. It's not his real personality. And we saw very skillful deflection and blaming of others. In the case of these things like the six foot distancing, mask usage, et cetera, he put the blame for these policies that were he acknowledged were not based on science directly on the CDC and by inference on Bob Redfield, who uh, he does not get along with. Uh, the, the whole exercise of his presentation was fascinating to watch uh, from the adulation uh, that was given by particularly the Democratic side, um, painting him as a hero through uh, the uh, very collegial, friendly, kind of chummy uh, conversation that he had with the Republican uh, counsel towards the end. He made a number of statements in which he threw people under the bus, basically. Uh, and notably, uh, this gentleman, Dr. Morenz, right. who has the title of being a senior advisor to Dr. Fauci, had been with Dr. Fauci for decades. Um, if you believe Dr. Morenz's emails, they have a close working relationship, see each other regularly, it sounded like at least on a weekly basis. Dr. Morenz has the ability to visit Tony in his home and pass documents. But Dr. Fauci basically acted as if he hardly knew him and uh, said that the title of senior advisor was really just basically honorific. Uh, it was just a particular governmental title. It didn't really mean anything in terms of the relationship with Fauci. And yet we have this series of emails and correspondence between Mr. Daszak, uh, a kind of an intermediary at Boston University, and Mr. Morenz, Dr. Morenz, in, in which uh, Dr. Morenz is relating to Dr. Daszak conversations that he's having with Dr. Fauci on a regular basis. Um, down to the level of granularity of talking about Dr. Fauci getting rather colorful in his language when he's expressing his sympathy for Dr. Daszak and all he's been through. But Tony acts like, uh, Tony Fauci acts as if uh, he hardly knew the guy. This is just not credible based on the emails. He also uh, said that if the Great Barrington Declaration had been adopted, I believe he said there would be a million more deaths that's completely at odds with the data. And remember that the Great Barrington Declaration was basically a restatement of what had been U.S. government and WHO policy up until the point when the U.S. government adopted and WHO adopted basically the CCP solution. Uh, but uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, in, in his efforts to defend himself, uh, basically said that the authors of the Great Barrington Declaration uh, would have caused a million deaths if they had had their way with people. Uh, again, striking uh, example of Dr. Fauci just 
going um, aggressive directly against people that were saying things that were inconvenient for him. This happened all the way through the testimony, but he did it with a smile. So let me kind of dig down on that, Dr. Malone, to, to see kind of what's behind this, because when you look at the consequences and, and, and he, you know, he, he, putting on that different front, maybe it's designed to just make this thing go away, they can move on. But there was some acknowledgement that there were consequences, non-public health consequences to the decisions for shutdowns and such. But I don't see any evidence to suggest that any in the scientific field there or here in Washington are acting upon that information. In fact, you've been tracking the World Health Organization. It looks like they're trying to cement into concrete everything that was done wrong during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, into marching orders for all member states. Cement and more really further expand uh, Dr. Tedros's uh, power to act unilaterally and uh, there's some new clauses in there about the importance of uh, nation states building capabilities in their communication systems for public health to counter mis and disinformation. There's two separate statements in, I think it's annex number one. Right. What was particularly striking about what happened in Geneva, and of course I was there because I was involved in a conference that was being held simultaneously and then a protest that was held last Saturday against the World Health Organization in front of uh, the UN building. But uh, what was remarkable was that the this um, meeting of the World Health Assembly, which is an annual uh, meeting of representatives from all the nation states that are members of the World Health Organization signatories, uh, they have uh, rules about adoption of new regulations or modifications to these international health regulations, IHRs. And uh, that requires that they complete the draft and then allow the nation states four months to review them. But instead, what they did is they literally worked late into the night behind closed doors to come up with these modifications to the IHRs and then pass them by acclamation, no actual vote. Uh, I hear the rumor was that they even turned off the microphones uh, for many of the nation states so that they wouldn't interfere in the discussions of uh, among those that are, were empowered to participate. Uh, this type of unilateral behavior, uh, really arrogance, seems to be typical of the World Health Organization under Mr. Tedros Ghebreyos, Dr. Tedros. Uh, and uh, that is uh, another reason for serious concern about these policies that are being put in place, because he's being given a lot of power. Um, he basically is completely unaccountable to anybody that's elected. So let me ask you about their procedures that require these to be published in advance so that the member states can review them. Is there any enforcement mechanism that would require them to adhere to these stated guidelines and procedures? Only in the sense that if they fail to comply with these agreed upon procedures, then uh, multiple international lawyers uh, from the UK, US and elsewhere have asserted that that would make any product, work product coming out of their deliberations literally illegal. Uh, it would have no uh, weight in terms of international law, which is what they're trying to uh, advance is basically a treaty. The, this uh, international health regulations is functionally a treaty. And uh, so by violating the rules that have been agreed upon by the member states and uh, proceeding with this by acclamation rather than an actual vote, and I understand that uh, at least five nation states subsequently objected to this, even though they asserted that it was uh, unanimous, uh, that makes the document uh, um, not legally binding. That's that's the enforcement. Is that if this was taken into international court, it would it wouldn't hold up.
So th that would be the remedy then t for those concerned about this. It would have to go to the international court and be challenged. Would it have to be by one of the member states who opposed, or do individual yeah, citizens? Yeah, no, member states would be the ones with standing. Uh, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an international lawyer. But that's my understanding. What we have, so that's one remedy, and and that's obviously challenging and time consuming. The other one has been really piloted by the state of Louisiana, in which uh, uh, states within the United States, you know, we're focused here on ourselves. Have uh, the state of Louisiana has passed legislation that says that they will not abide by the diktats of the World Health Organization, and by the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the right to regulate the practice of medicine is not assigned to the federal government and therefore vests to the states. What this sets up is a constitutional crisis because these are being treated as treaties, even though the Senate has not reviewed and approved. Uh, and so that gets into some really dicey issues with the Constitution about the primacy of the Constitution relative to any international treaties that are agreed upon by the executive branch. This turns out to not be entirely clear hmm. in, in the U.S. Constitution. As it's well, it, because no one envisioned that we would be mo marching down this path to global governance, which is exactly what this this is. I, we just have a couple minutes left, Dr. Malone. I wanna, I'm going to go back to, to, and these two issues are very relevant to what Dr. Fauci had to testify before the committee uh, yesterday and the World Health Organization, because what, we're, what we saw during the COVID pandemic and what the Biden administration did, as you talked about, restricting uh, communication, setting up these systems by which it could be suppressed, um, the mandates, the closures, the masking, all of these, the vaccinations. Vaccine cards, vaccine cards are included, digital or uh, paper. We, we don't have any evidence to suggest that all of these things worked. In fact, in some cases, it's Thank contrary. You. Thank you, Tony. Um, yes, I could, I, I could reach out and hug you for saying that uh, precisely. Uh, as you point out, they're doubling down on failed policies, and the logic is that somehow the World Health Organization, with all of its self-congratulation, has, has done a good job during this, and that's absolutely not the case. But the logic is they've done such a good job that they deserve more power, more authority, and uh, more capital. So, more is, so I, I want to go back to early, my earlier question. Is, was this the coaching for Dr. Fauci, knowing that you know, he represented what the WHO is after, and so he needed to come in before committee and deflect it and not be combative, hoping this will go away so the World, World Health Organization is able to advance their agenda? Yeah. I, I, uh, I wish uh, I could endorse that Dr. Fauci had such a global, long-range view. My personal bias is that Dr. Fauci is mostly focused on Dr. Fauci and evading accountability for his role in the mismanagement of the COVID crisis. He showed all the signs of somebody who'd been carefully prepared as one does, for instance, if you're going into an expert witness situation against hostile lawyers and uh, um, came, came across very effectively. Uh, with this uh, aw shucks, down home kind of tone, which was uh, contrasted with an audio clip that was played by one of the congressmen, one of the few uh, uh, physicians who practiced uh, during the COVID crisis, practiced emergency medicine. And he played a clip in which Dr. Fauci was being extremely aggressive in an interview stating that Basically, it was going to be necessary to force people to take the vaccine right. by uh, withdrawing their ability to earn a living uh, um, and support their families uh, as a way to overcome their ideologic uh, issues um, with taking the vaccine. As you know, one of those ideologic issues is uh, um, religious exemptions. Right, right, which they uh, completely swept just swept aside. Dr. Malone, we're out of time. Uh, always great to talk with you. Thanks so much for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having me on, Tony.